All right, welcome back everyone. <clears throat> We're going to move on to chapter two. Um, if you want, you should open up the notes that I provided for chapter two and we'll go through the notes uh, throughout the lecture. Uh, and then I'll move on to chapter three. So chapter two, choice in a world of scarcity. Um, as we discussed a little bit in the last chapter, uh, economics is based on scarcity at its root, um, at its very heart. It's about having potentially infinite demands and uh, finite supply, right? Um, everyone would take anything for free, basically, if they could, um, and yet the supplies of everything is finite. Uh, the supply of gold, the supply of paper money, the supply of uh, dirt, the supply of land, um, everything is finite. And so uh, that's the basic problem uh, that we're trying to solve and, and trying to determine how people behave uh, given that they have uh, demands and that the supply is finite. <clears throat> Um, so if you look at section 2.1, how individuals make choices based on their budget. Um, so this, this really simple figure 2.2, the budget constraint, um, it's showing you uh, we can buy either hamburgers or we can buy bus tickets, right? And you have hamburgers on the x-axis and bus tickets on the y-axis. Um, and you have to make a choice. Uh, you only have $10 um, or you only have a particular amount of money, um, you want both burgers and bus tickets, or you know, both gold and a factory, or you know, whatever it is. Um, you can shape these things out graphically uh, to try to determine your best point of interest. Um, as a company or as an individual, do I want to be at point B, where I get four burgers uh, and four bus tickets, um, I'm probably not going to need the maximum amount of bus tickets over here at 20, uh, but I will need food to live. Um, and so we have to figure out what is the best configuration of burgers and bus tickets given my budget constraint. Um, stupid example, um, I just wanted to sort of walk you through how the graph works. <clears throat> Um, all of this is based on opportunity costs, right? Um, if I choose to do one thing, then I am inevitably giving up another thing, and that is an opportunity cost. Um, this also uh, sort of walks you through marginal analysis rather than total analysis or analysis in toto. Um, <clears throat> marginal analysis is about uh, what if we make a small incremental change? Uh, how does that affect our... How does that affect our benefits? Um, if we make a very small incremental change, how does it affect our utility? I guess is, is how they would refer to it in economics. Um, your, your utility is your benefit. Uh, and so if we make a very small change, um, do we get uh, uh, an increasing utility? Uh, I would also suggest to you that you learn about this law of diminishing marginal utility, um, often sort of <clears throat> mistaken as the law of diminishing returns, but they are very, very closely um, related. So uh, the law of diminishing marginal utility is the idea that say say I'm a company and I'm producing pillows. You know, I'm, I'm the my pillow guy. Um, and I want to increase my production. Um, and by doing that, I decide to offer my employees um, a wage increase, right? Uh, research suggests that if I increase their wages, they'll work that much harder uh, and produce more pillows per hour. So we get more output and um, eventually more profit because of that output, right? Uh, but, but the amount that you increase someone's wages related to their output um, clearly will have a diminishing marginal utility, right? Um, as I increase your wage by $1, perhaps your production increases by 10%, right? That's that's phenomenal, you know, given our profit rate. But if I increase your wage by uh, $200, uh, no matter how many pillows you can produce in an hour, it's not going to add up. 
right? Um, so you get this uh, reduction in marginal utility. Um, and if you look at the, the cute little graph um, that I provided here of utility um, compared to X, you can see that um, as you move along the line of X, um, say this is a wage increase, uh, your utility from that wage increase reduces uh, drastically as you start to approach this asymptotic curve, is what they call it, a curve um, that will never perfectly flatten out. Um, and hypothetically, it will always keep increasing, um, but it's, it's so negligible that it's meaningless. Okay. Um, sunk costs, if we're, if we're moving on past the diminishing returns. Um, sunk costs are costs that were incurred in the past and cannot be recovered according to the book. Um, if you think of this um, from the individual or microeconomic perspective, this is like time. Um, my time can never be returned to me and so it's a sunk cost and so I better get um, my greatest equilibrium value out of it. Um, it can also mean immovable sunk costs on the macro scale. So if you're looking at factories or um, say Nike builds a new factory in Vietnam, um, that factory is kind of a sunk cost. You can't really move it. You can't take it back. Um, and so it may be an efficient expense, but it's not something that you can get back. And so I, I guess um, the factory itself, the walls and all that kind of stuff are, are some cost. Maybe you can sell back the land, um, so that wouldn't be necessarily considered a sunk cost, but uh, these are things that you can never really retrieve in the end. Uh, and some factories are different than others. If you imagine, um, um, imagine a factory that... Okay, purifies uranium or plutonium, right? Um, these are massive, massive um, expenditures that you have to put in, and the equipment that you have to purchase can't really be moved. On the other hand, if you if you imagine, say, a garment factory where all you really need are some sewing machines, um, very different costs. And we'll talk about that later in the semester too. Um, there there are differences in uh, upkeep costs and maintenance costs and factory costs for different types of industries. Um, so so a, a garment factory would be a lot easier to move and would not necessarily be a sunk cost, whereas uh, building a plutonium refinery facility uh, would definitely be a sunk cost and you couldn't really move. Uh, production Possibilities Frontier and Social Choices is section 2.2. Uh, so here, if you look at the Production Possibilities Curve, or the PPF, uh, it's a really simple way to understand um, choices and the choices that have to be made given restraints on supply. Um, so here they compare healthcare versus education. Um, every society wants both a good healthcare and a good educational system, right? Um, but resources are not infinite, and so we have to make hard choices. Uh, do we want to provide <clears throat> the best healthcare facilities on earth at the expense of being able to provide families with early childhood, uh, early child care, um, which is a choice we make in America? Um, in, in France and Germany and a lot of the developed countries, um, they, have, they have chosen to provide early child care to their citizenry, um, but they don't necessarily spend that money, say, on um, high-end inventions in healthcare. Uh, which is something that America does generally do. Um, we're at the forefront of, of um, experimental drugs and experimental treatments and those sorts of things. So uh, a society has to make choices. And this PPF curve um, sort of shows you how we can map out those choices um, given the, the finite supply. <clears throat> and so if we decide to, to provide Again, this is going to be theoretical, right? The, I, we can never decide to have zero health care and 100% education, that sort of F point on the map uh, or on this graph. 
Um, but theoretically, let's say F is where we decide to uh, to provide a hundred percent education um, from the moment you're born till the moment you die. It's all free, uh, but it's sort of a you're on your own for healthcare, right? Um, it's that it's that brutish, short, rough uh, existence. Um, and on the other hand, we could have the greatest healthcare on the planet, and we're at point A, but we don't educate our citizenry, right? Um, doesn't make a lot of sense either. Again, this is theoretical, but but generally we'll be somewhere at point C or B or D, um, and and though that's the decision we have to make. Do do we want to give up a little health care um, to be at point D and have excellent education, or vice versa? So uh, this is just a really easy way to picture and conceptualize um, the the most efficient usage of our resources and this pink line uh, from A to F um, that is our 100% efficiency line. If we're anywhere inside of that line uh, we're not operating at 100% efficiency and anything outside of that line is uh, theoretical, right? It doesn't really exist. And the only way that we can really get there is by increasing our technological understandings, uh, some sort of new invention, th that sort of thing, right? Um, to where we can, we can push 100% efficiency even further. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Uh, you should also know the difference between productive Efficiency, we'll talk about efficiency a lot in economics, right? Um, how do we get to our most efficient use of resources, our most efficient choice, our most efficient position on the PPF curve, etc.? Um, but there are different kinds of efficiency. Uh, the, the, first, the book points out that first we have productive efficiency. Uh, this means that we are operating on 100%. Um, and we could be anywhere on this pink line from A to F. That is productive efficiency. Uh, allocative efficiency is different. Uh, we are at 100%, um, but it is suggesting that we have allocated our resources to the point where society agrees would be the best allocation of those resources on that curve. Right, And so there's only one individual point. And so if the allocative efficient point is C, but we're operating at B, that means we are productively efficient. We are operating at a 100% efficiency, but somewhere democracy has sort of failed us and we haven't been able to explain or get across the idea that as a society, we would prefer to be at the C point rather than the B point. So while we're being productively efficient, we're being allocatively inefficient, if that makes sense. Now, um, inefficiency in general is if you look at the next curve of healthcare and education where we add point R, that is inefficient. We are not operating at 100% efficiency um, as a society, and we need to do something to fix that to get back to the actual curve and productive efficiency. And um, a lot of times people suggest that this is, say, in the healthcare industry in America, this is um, our over-reliance on paper, right, and, and on... Uh, bureaucracy, and if we could sort of digitize and um, and reduce the amount of administrative staff and bureaucracy in healthcare, uh, we would be operating more efficiently. Um, you know, that's that's for economists to to study and write, but that I guess would be an example of of where we might be as a country operating inefficiently. Um, comparative advantage is something we'll talk about later on in the course as well when we talk about the Stolper Samuelson's theory of comparative advantage and um, and being sure as a nation that you are producing the most efficiently, right? Um, and so comparative advantage is the idea that, um, say, America makes um, inventions and, and say, cellular telephone technology really well. Um, 
America is not good at growing coffee beans, right? We, we would be radically inefficient in growing coffee beans because we're in the wrong geographic and climatological area. I mean, it, it just wouldn't make sense unless you're in Hawaii. Hawaii is a good Kona region. Um, so the idea would, th would be that Brazil focuses on growing coffee because Brazil has the geographical and climatological um, advantage. And America would focus on um, on telecommunications technology, right? Um, and that <clears throat> America has no interest and would actually be losing out if they're producing coffee rather than producing technology. Uh, you know, telecommunications technology, uh, and vice versa. Brazil should ha has no reason to be in telecoms, and rather they should be focusing on those things in which they have a comparative advantage. Um, now, th this makes sense at the broad scale, right? But but some of the third world countries also retort and say that, well, that's just your way of sort of holding us down and ensuring that we uh, constantly stay a peripheral or satellite state and we're only making sort of raw materials for your empire and then you're selling us back developed goods and just reiterating and... and um, and circulating the idea that the rich states stay rich and the poor states stay poor, right? Uh, and we'll we'll talk about some of that stuff philosophically later about the the more nitty gritty nuances of what the idea of comparative advantage might mean um, to citizens of the world um, in poor and in rich states. And whether the idea of comparative comparative advantage is actually propagating um, the international system as is, uh, it's an interesting argument. It's it's uh, very fun to read. I don't really know which side I fall on. I think they both have um, excellent points. So, okay, uh, confronting objections to the economic approach. This is section two point three. Um, we touched on some of this in the very first chapter, the idea that models uh, are problematic because they're an oversimplification of the world. And, you know, I retort that, of course, they're an oversimplification. Um, that's what models are for, right? That's what, that's what statistics are for. Um, we can't just watch the world all the time um, to understand exactly the nuances. Um, the models offer us statistical and behavioral patterns. Um, and of course, with human behavior, um, there are human idiosyncrasies, right? Um, and no one, uh, excuse me, not no one, but pe there are individuals who will always uh, perform outside of sort of the norm, the normal curve, and will, will perform differently than models suggest. Uh, but models are not suggesting that everyone will perform this way. It suggests that this is these are patterns of behavior that we would expect um, under normal conditions and for the, the majority of people. But you are going to get outsiders, you're going to get outliers, um, those sorts of things. So just just Again, don't don't just completely disregard models outright. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, let's see. People, firms, and society should not behave this way is the other retort. Uh, and I would say that <laughs> economics isn't about philosophy or moralizing or telling you what the right thing to do is. Economics is just merely trying to describe... Given these conditions, A, B, and C, how should humans behave given that we live in a world of scarcity? Um, it, it, they have no intention of moralizing or telling you what is the ethically right thing to do. Um, economics is merely a tool for trying to understand patterns in human behavior. Uh, so that's chapter two. Have a great week, and um, I'll get the next chapter up soon. Where did it go?